and gentlemen. I hope everyone's enjoying this wonderful day. Uh, I personally hate the cold, but hey, you know, that's just me. I'm not going to rain on everyone else's parade. So I hope you all get to enjoy today because this weather stinks for me. I'm an old man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hello and welcome once again. Uh, Y'all are here for day two of Teen Driver Education, the Hernandez Driveway. And ladies and gentlemen, please remember, every day when we show up, as soon as uh, you join the live stream, go ahead and get that name in the chat just so we know who's hanging out with us and uh, who's uh, watching the live stream and who it is that's, uh, uh, and then the names that aren't commented are the people that are watching on the replay, right? So please and thank you folks. All right, uh, but today we are discussing sign signals and roadway markings, the Hernandez driveway. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, we're gonna be going over a bunch of information over the next three days. Just to remind y'all, just to re repeat it, reiterate, and make sure that everyone remembers, okay, today, tomorrow, and the next day, y'all will be learning everything you need to pass the DPS written exam. On Friday, we will be going over the review that has every single question that could potentially be on your DPS written exam. We're going to go over that as class together. All right, I'm going to read the answer or the question and the answers uh, for the first half. The second half is signs, so it'll just be like an image and then I'll read the answers. Um, but it's going to be audience participation driven. All right, I get three right answers, we move on. I get three wrong answers, I explain what the correct answer is and why so that it sticks a little better, and then we move on. If nobody answers, well, then I'm just going to stand here and, and, and we're going to be stuck on a question until I get bored and move on. All right, so please folks, we do want lots of participation, um, just, just so that we know you're paying attention and not just sitting there with your laptop on, right? Um, but let's go ahead and get into today's lesson because we don't have a ton of time and uh, we do have quite a bit of information to cover. All right, uh, at the end, if we have any extra time, I will open it up for extra questions, issues, or concerns. Uh, that way we can help you out, folks. All right, so let's get rocking and rolling. All right, sign signals and roadway markings. Traffic signs come in a variety of shapes and colors. It is, in fact, the same number of shapes as colors in the United States, in the state of Texas. And if you had to guess, how many different shapes, or if you know the colors, how many different colors do we use on signs? On signs here in the state of Texas. Anybody got a guess? Anybody courageous enough to throw up what you think may be the answer? And folks, I would like to stress something before we start uh, asking questions. It is better to be wrong and then find out some, the correct answer than it is to be wrong and not say anything um, or th than it is to not even guess. Uh, because when we're wrong about something and someone corrects us, our brain kind of gets a little offended by that, right? Uh, but because of that, you will never forget that fact, right? So don't feel uh, that there's any shame in ever taking a wrong guess when you're just guessing, when you don't know. Because if y'all already knew all this information, you wouldn't need the course, all right? If parents were, were teaching their kids uh, the way we needed to be, um, driver's education would never become mandatory again, all right? Uh, but it is. So you're going to guess around five or six. That's a decent guess. It's a little bit higher than that. All right, uh, we actually use a total, let me get back on that screen. We actually use a total of eight. We got eight different shapes and eight different colors. Now, some of those shapes do a lot of jobs. Some of those shapes provide a variety of information and there's no standard. Some of those shapes though, have one job. They're Leroy, right? You had one job, Leroy, and he messed it up. No, but see, if a shape has just one job, then we know, regardless of whether or not we can read or see the sign, that we're gonna follow that one job instruction. So let's go ahead and jump right in and we're gonna start with the shapes first because the easiest one, the one that y'all learned first when y'all were kids, was the octagon. Anybody remember what the octagon is? What's the octagon sign telling us to do? And it's not, fight! No, no, no wrong octagon. You know, the, this is the, the, the octagon you see on the side of the road. Eight sides. Anybody remember what that guy's telling us to do? Anybody? 
There's only one? Well, because there's only one, we know that whenever we see an octagon, whether we can read it or not, we still know what we have to do because it's the only job the octagon has. And that is the stop sign. So, what does that mean? That means even if it has no paint, no writing, just the fact that it's an octagon, you'll know that it's a stop sign. Great job, folks. All right, yay, somebody found, found the uh, little, what is it, emoji stop sign? Very cute. Uh, <laughs> all right, next we got the equilateral triangle. If they got the stop sign, they probably got this one too. All right, now there's only one sign that is an equilateral triangle. Anybody know what that one is? All right, stops kind of easy. You know, that's that first one that we learned. Equilateral triangle. What's the equilateral triangle? It's got a word on it, and that word is the name of the sign, so maybe, maybe. That's okay. That's the yield sign, folks. Now, the yield sign used to be yellow, but did not get the respect it needed. So they went ahead and changed the color to red and white so that people would pay a little more attention to it because people just ignored yield signs. And there is something we got to do during a yield, so we'll talk about that. But again, even if there's no paint, no writing, just the fact that it's an equilateral triangle, you know it's a yield sign. Now, I actually saw one of these ones painted up like the devil from Futurama, and I was just, I was extremely impressed, but I was also kind of puzzled, like, did they paint this here really fast, because that would have made it more impressive, because it looked great, or did they somehow, like, take it down and then bring it back to put it back up, and that's just, you know, like, work to it. <laughs> you got to respect the work ethic on that one because they wanted it to look good, but it was, it was awesome. But because it was an equilateral triangle, I knew that it was a yield sign and I knew what I had to do. All right. Now we've got horizontal and vertical rectangles and these things provide a ton of information. So there's no standard response to them. All right. But according to the state of Texas, they are two different shapes. So we call them two different shapes. Now vertical rectangles, generally provide us rules for the road that we're currently on. It tells you how things work, what we gotta do, what kind of speed we can go, things like that. Horizontally, horizontal rectangles, generally speaking, are telling you uh, where stuff is, it's mounted above the roadway, what's coming up, but horizontal rectangles can also be one-way signs, which are directions, you know, rules, uh, or it could also be, quite simply, you know, just a regular street sign because that is a horizontal rectangle but at the end of the day horizontal rectangles other than the one-way sign are going to be telling you where you are or what's coming up all right uh, and then our circle sign well there's only one sign that's got a circle job so if it looks like pac-man if it looks like the planet earth if it's ten thousand rust particles holding hands singing kumbaya keeping it together doesn't matter because there's only one circle we know that we are approaching a train. Many people want to say, do not enter, because you know they're, they're, they're thinking you know, that, that circle and, and bar. But a circle sign is identifying that a railroad crossing is down the road, is coming up ahead. All right, now folks, if you can see the railroad sign and the train can see you, it cannot stop before it gets to that crossing. All right, uh, stopping distance depends heavily on weight. Um, a 18 wheeler with maximum capacity can take three to four times the stopping distance, or two to three times the stopping distance of a conventional vehicle. Um, a train can take 20 to 30 times the stopping distance of a conventional vehicle, depending on the weight. It's crazy, folks. Two, three miles just to come to a stop if they're going 40, 50 miles an hour. All right, and that's typical for a train. So do not expect a train to be able to stop. And uh, we will say this many times, never try to beat the train. Um, but uh, we'll even watch a video on people that uh, met the train. All right, so moving on. Now, the next shape we've got is the pennant. This is the latest and greatest in sign technology. All right, it's been in use for about a year and a half maybe. And if you haven't seen one yet, that's okay. That means that the people you're riding with haven't messed up. But what this sign is indicating is a no passing zone. All right, many drivers miss this sign though for two main reasons. One, they're not scanning the roadway the way they need to be. We need to be constantly looking. We need to be checking intersections. We need to be looking at those signs as we're driving down the road because driving is a very visual task. If you're not looking, it's very hard to be a safe driver. The second reason is that this 
Unlike most signs, which are on the right side of the roadway, this one's on the left. Because as soon as you change lanes to pass someone in a no passing zone, there is now suddenly a huge sign really close to your face saying no passing zone. Right? Let me know, hey, you need to move back that way. That's why it looks like an arrow, because it's pointing you in the direction you need to move yourself back. Right? It, that one used to be just a little rectangle sign that said do not pass. People ignored it. They changed the signs. Here's an interesting fact about signs, um, or at least I think it's interesting. You probably will think it's dumb. But um, signs get changed if they're not impactful enough. Signs get created when a need comes up for one, and signs get put in a location once it's deemed necessary. What does that mean? That means if a sign is warning you about an intersection, people have crashed in that intersection because they did not see it coming. That's why there's a sign warning you. If a sign is warning you about a curve, people have driven off that road because that curve was too much for them to handle, and they had to put a sign up there. Every sign you see on the roadway generally has a tragic story if it's, you know, in an old location. Signs in a new location, they've learned enough to know, hey, we need to have one here because if we don't, we're gonna have problems, all right? But any sign that's like in the old part of the city or just an old sign, generally speaking, something bad's happened there and that's why the sign was placed. If things change or things get added on, if it goes from a stop sign to a traffic signal, it's because the stop sign wasn't cutting it. Either traffic was backing up or people were running the stop and crashing, all right? So, diamond signs. Diamonds are all warning signs and we respond the exact same way to all of them. We slow down, okay, that's it. We just, we slow down, take our foot off the accelerator and just look and figure out what the sign is warning us about. In this situation, bumps, that means, hey, I need to slow down to like 10, 15 miles an hour to hit these bumps, otherwise I could do some damage to my car, okay. The sign bump and dip are the two most ignored warning signs and both of those can cause hundreds of dollars worth of damage to your vehicle. I know from personal experience because I've ignored both of them and they each cost me about 200 bucks. It was rather unfortunate and stupid. But it's what happens, okay? These signs are there for a reason, folks. Just take your foot off the accelerator, take a few moments to figure out what's gonna keep you safe and then you do that, all right? All diamond signs mean warning, so anytime there's a sign that's gonna warn you about something, it's gonna be a diamond sign, all right? Now, there is something up ahead on the roadway that you need to be aware of. That's all that these signs are doing, is telling you something is coming up down the road and you need to be careful because there is an element of danger, okay? All right, now, we also have the Pentagon sign. Now, the Pentagon sign, y'all have seen about 3,000 times in your life, minimum. Um, and uh, there's only one sign that's in the shape of a Pentagon, and it's not like the Pentagon building in Washington. This is shaped like a little schoolhouse or a little house uh, because it is the school zone. Now, when I started talking about the Pentagon sign, did anybody's brain go straight to school zone? Because I can almost guarantee that it didn't. Um, Y'all see the sign regularly, but because we're paying attention to our cell phones, our classmates, other people on the bus, and the stuff going down, we're not always really paying attention, all right? Because how many times have you seen it? How many times should you have seen it? And when I said Pentagon, did you immediately go to, oh, that's the school one? Not so much, all right? That's the best and worst part about the human brain. It's a fascinating piece of machinery, but it likes to think that it's better than what it really is, and it's not, I mean, we're just, we're very flawed, but it's all right. Now, colors, red means stop, yield, or prohibited, all right? So you have to quit moving, allow others ahead of you, or you're not allowed to do something. Plain and simple, all right? Yellow is a warning sign. Anytime they're warning you about something, it will be on a yellow diamond sign. This warning is a winding road. Now, the reason that we use the winding road on the example is that the winding road is generally on... Uh, or not generally, it's on three or four out of the five different uh, written exams that we have available for our students because a lot of Texans don't know what the winding road sign is. And it simply means that when you are on a winding road, you are on a road that has lots of consecutive curves and it's going to be going back and forth just like the sign looks like, but it's more than two and it's you don't know how many. Okay, so we need to slow down, drive a little more cautiously, watch out for animals and other traffic. 
right? That's a winding road. Now, I've said winding road a whole bunch of times because hearing something seven times will help you remember it. Hearing, speaking, reading, saying something 14 times will allow you to remember it for an extended period of time. Uh, once you hit about the 20s, it's yours. That information will be with you until you stop using it and forget it that way. Okay. So knowing that this sign is a winding road, and me saying that it's a winding road seven times, the very first time you see it in the assignment, hopefully means, or in the lecture, hopefully means that you'll remember that this yellow diamond warning sign is warning you about a winding road when you get to it on the exam. Because most of you will see it on your exam. <clears throat> but we slow down and proceed with caution whenever we see those diamond signs and figure out what's gonna be the best thing. If it's like watch for an intersection ahead and we've got the green light, well, we look, check for traffic, if nobody's coming, okay, we're good. We can, you know, crisis averted, okay? But if it's warning us about an intersection coming up ahead and we have cars coming from both directions and we've got the red light, well, then crisis not averted, we need to continue to be careful, all right? Now, black and white, those are regulatory rules of the road. They tell you how the road operates, how the road's working, all right? One way sign is indicating because we read our signs bottom to top, that it's not only a one-way street, but it's a one-way street, and if you want to turn onto it, you have to turn to the right, all right? But speed limit signs, those are rules of the road. Slower traffic, keep right. That's a rule of the road. All those awesome little diagrams that tell you how the road works, those are rules of the roads, all right? Orange, those are construction and detour, okay? A detour is an alternate route around construction, and everyone knows what construction is in the valley, because, you know, it's the valley. Um, Here's the thing though, folks, in case you did not know this, in the state of Texas, all traffic fines are doubles, doubled if workmen or equipment are present, right? What does that mean? That means that if there are people actively working on the road and you are in a construction zone along the expressway, if you're breaking a rule, they will double the cost of your ticket. So please drive extra safe in those construction zones because it's people putting their lives on the line for those jobs, right? Uh, and then green, those are our guide signs. They tell us where we're going, where we're coming. And it's also the color of normal street signs because it's telling you where you are, okay? Uh, so they're usually above the expressway uh, for the most part though, right? Uh, and they let you know where you're going, what's coming up, where you are, okay? What, which roads are, or how far to the exits, things like that, right? Okay, but when we see them in the city, it's the street signs, okay? And then we've got blue. Those are my favorite on those long trips because blue is motorist service, right? What's motorist service? Oh, that's that rest area with the bathrooms and the fountains. You can go stretch your legs after every couple hours. Or if you're starving and you want a fast food restaurant, the blue signs will have all the restaurants. We'll have all the gas stations. We'll all have all the hotels and motels. Anything that a motorist might need. Even tire shops in case, you know, you had a blowout or you need to get off a spare or stuff like that. Those will be listed on those blue signs. Fantastic for those long trips because they take the guesswork out of, oh, if I get off on this exit, can I get to a gas station? I really need one. You get off on the wrong exit and you could wind up spending 20, 30 minutes just trying to get them to the right spot when you didn't have. Okay, so these blue signs are awesome. Um, and then brown is public recreation, cultural interest. They mark state parks, historical districts, hiking trails, and museums. Uh, when you're within the historical district or the historical area of the city, which is like the original part that the city developed from, uh, that will have brown street signs. Uh, like uh, out there in, uh, in FAR, uh, it's the, uh, like over there on Cage, you'll notice that the signs are brown around there near Cage and Old 83 uh, because that is the historic district. That is where the city first developed from. Right, uh, but those are fun because those are cheat days, right? You know, you go do something, doesn't cost a whole bunch of money, and you spend the day doing something kind of cool. All right, but let's talk about the two most important signs because I, I don't think people in the valley really understand how these work. They seem to do, they seem to yield at stop signs and just completely ignore the yield sign uh, as if it's not telling you to do something specific. And we need to fix that, right? And we're starting with y'all. Y'all are going to be, uh, you know, our students are the ones that are going to be doing it right. And then eventually all of the people that are doing it absolutely wrong, are, they're going to be gone. And uh, it's just going to be all the experts doing it safe, right? 
So stop sign, what do you have to do? You have to make a full stop. How long does a full stop last? Full stop is a minimum of three seconds. Now check this out. Okay, you drive, you get to an intersection, you're like, okay, no car coming, no car coming. Oh, there's a car coming. Is he slowing down? Okay, he's slowing down. That took longer than three seconds, all right? But if you come up to the intersection, you're like, no car, no car, no car. That took less than three seconds. But the thing is, folks, is that the reason that we need to make those full three seconds is because regardless of if there's no one there, we need to be making that same level of check. Because we may just look at something and be like, oh, yeah, there's a car right there, and go on, and then the car runs the stop. And now we've been in a collision. Why? Because we saw them, but we didn't keep watching to make sure that they were slowing down to stop. And that's why we need to be sure that we're using at least three seconds. If it takes eight seconds to be safe, then you're gonna wait eight seconds. If it takes 30 seconds to be safe, because I don't know, a, an 18 wheeler is trying to turn through the intersection and they're going super slow, then you're gonna wait that long, okay? You will not go before it's safe. That's what those three seconds are for. So at 2 a.m. when there's no traffic and you're like, boom, 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 empty. One, two, three, and then you can go. Because that's the law, folks. All right, now, the more important question though is when do you start counting? Okay, when your vehicle has completely stopped moving, all right, well, what does that mean? That means after your vehicle has finished rocking backwards and forwards and come to a complete stop, then you start counting. One, two, three. Everything's still good, no traffic coming, awesome. And you continue on. Okay, so first we're going to find the thick white line. All right, we're gonna park our vehicle completely behind the thick white line, right? The reason that line is there is that is where it is safe for you to park or stop, not park, but stop, so that vehicles may turn and pedestrians may cross the street without risk of injury or damage to vehicles. Okay, so one more time. We stop behind the line because it prevents car accidents and it prevents people from getting hit by a car. So if you stop ahead of the line and you get a ticket for it, well, you were explained that it's behind the line for safety reasons. You do things the safe way, right? That's what we want, we want safe drive, all right? DPS regulations say the ideal stop is four to seven feet behind the thick white line. Are you gonna jump out and, and grab a ruler? Are you gonna have something strapped to the front of your car with a tennis ball seven feet long to know exactly? Of course not, that would be ridiculous. When you're approaching the thing, white, or the thick white line, stop where you can still see it. If you can still see the line, you are four to seven feet behind the line, unless you have a VW minibus, and then you could be like two feet behind the line, but that's okay, because you're still behind the line, all right? Don't lose the line, and you will be stopped behind it, and you will leave room for pedestrians to cross and vehicles to turn safely. Now, if there is no thick white line, you will use the position of the pole. All you have to do is park behind the pole. So what does that mean? That means you see the stop sign right this way through your windshield, not this way through the passenger window. Right? If you're looking at the stop sign or it's pulled through the passenger window, you have gone too far forward. You needed to stop feet back. But hey, that's all right, folks, because you're gonna learn the right way, okay? Now, sometimes the thick white line is far away from the sign. I said that that line is positioned there because that is where it is safe for vehicles to turn and people to cross. So there is a valid reason for this to be there, right? So do not stop ahead of this line thinking, man, that's for other people. No, it's for you, right? And the biggest mistake that people do this is when they stop on the railroad tracks ahead of this line, right? Um, that you should not do because sometimes you get boxed in between two vehicles and this guy's not gonna run a red light and risk getting a ticket so that you don't get killed by a train because he doesn't want a ticket. Um, so yeah. Stay completely behind the line, all right? There are reasons why the line's located there. When it's super far away from the intersection, that intersection is used by large trucks, 18 wheelers, they need more room to turn, all right? If you're too close to that intersection, you will be hit. That white line has been placed there so they have the necessary space they need to complete their turn without hitting you, okay? Now, I worked at a body shop for about a year and a half, and I saw what happens when an 18 wheeler um, just, it, it hit the vehicle because the vehicle was too far forward and then they just kind of kept going and pushed the vehicle back 
and it caused, and this was a while back, but it caused about $4,000 worth of damage, and that lady was without her car for like two months, um, and she's super lucky that the frame wasn't damaged, because if it had been, then that vehicle would have been totaled. Um, now, let's go ahead and add some inflation on there, so just flat out double it because of how long it's been. Um, if you stop ahead of this line, it could easily cause $6,000 worth of damage, if not total your vehicle. So when you see the thick white line is really far back, stop behind it, please, 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 please. It's for your safety. All right. Now, sometimes we've got a big old tree and, you know, or a building. Tio Chewy hasn't trimmed his bogambilias in 37,000 years, and we just can't see. All right. So what do we do? All right. Well, doesn't matter if we can't see, we still need to stop completely behind the thick white line. All right. And we make our legal stop, right? We meet our minimum legal requirement. One, two, three, that's three full seconds. All right, one, two, three is not three seconds. One, two, three is not three seconds. One, two, three is three seconds, All right? You make that full stop and now you look forward. Is there an 18 wheeler waiting to turn ahead? You know there isn't, awesome. Now I'm gonna pull forward so I can see since there wasn't somebody waiting to turn and that extra space wasn't necessary at the moment, now I move my vehicle forward and check. If everything is clear and safe and sound, you can go. If there is a vehicle coming, you make a second stop, you wait for it to pass, and then you go when it's safe. And that's the key though. Every time we take off from a stop sign or every time we go at a green light, we don't go right away. We go once we've completed our full stop if we have to stop, and then we go once and only when it is safe and clear for us to do so. Okay. Do not advance too far into the intersection and, and block the lane of traffic coming from the perpendicular direction because if you pull forward just far enough and they barely hit the front of your vehicle, that could actually twist the frame and then your vehicle could be totaled. Okay. Even though the, the damage to the entire vehicle is very light, once the frame gets twisted, the next major crash you have Instead of withstanding, that frame is going to crumple and, well, it would cause increased damages to people inside too, right? So you just can't drive on a vehicle with a damaged frame. If you pull out too far forward, you are also responsible for that accident because you have entered their lane of traffic and you should not do that until you're ready to turn, all right? Now, the yield sign does not mean stop. All the yield sign means is allow others to use the intersection before you. Okay. But sometimes that does mean we have to stop. Other times it doesn't. Right? What you have to do, what you have to do, because even though there's situations where you may not have to stop, you are still required to do something. What is that? That is <laughs> slow down. Take your foot off the gas. You see a yield sign? Take your foot off the gas. Look at the intersection that you're approaching. Is there a vehicle coming from either direction that's going to be using the intersection ahead of you? If they are, you slow down more. If you're gonna get there around the same time, you slow down even more because you may have to stop, all right? If they're almost at the intersection ahead of you, you slow down enough to let them through, and then you just kind of keep at that speed. Once you make it through the intersection though, you go back to your regular speed, that's it. You slow down, you take your foot off the gas, you slow down even more if you need to to let somebody else use it ahead of you. And then when you get through the intersection, you just continue on. That's it. But the yield sign does mean that the person turning in front of you has the right of way, right? That's why the yield sign was put there. It's so that you can let those people join you in traffic or maybe they're just crossing over. But we still let them do it because they have that yield sign, okay? So how do we slow down? Take your foot off the accelerator, all right? That's how we slow down. Braking is actually pressing the brake and coming to that stop or decreasing speed rapidly, all right? Now, whenever you do lift your foot off the accelerator, when you're not actively pressing the gas, cover the brake. That way, if something comes up, if there's an emergency and you need to hit the brake, you'll be shortening your response time because it takes about a second and a half to see something, recognize that we need to do something in response to it, lift our foot off the gas and brake. 
If you take your foot and just hover over the brake, we can cut that time down to about 0.8 seconds. All right, that's definitely much faster. All right, anytime your foot is off the accelerator for any reason, just cover the brake, be ready to stop. Now, the right of way. Anytime two pass cross, street, alley, sidewalk, highway, or bike path, there is a rule that determines who has the right of way. Now, the right of way can be defined as the privilege of immediate use of the roadway. Yes, it sounds so fancy, I say it fancy. That's wonderful. Now, the simple rule is the first to stop is the first to go. Well, that's easy. That's kind of like the convenience store, right? First person that gets in line is the first person that gets checked out. Okay, people kind of got that one down, right? We'll discuss more complicated situations, the one that people in the valley don't understand too well, all right? But these are just the basics, all right? And here's the deal, folks. With full stops, with three second stops right now in the valley, you may not always get to take the right of way when it's your right of way because the other person is making a, you know, like a half a second stop because they don't know how the law works or they don't care. Okay. But we need to drive safe because, I mean, anybody here want to work two, three weeks to pay off a ticket? I know. So I drive safe. All right. I drive like a fuddy duddy and I've been doing that since I was about 25 because I don't want no tickets and I've gotten none. So awesome. Now, you can also yield the right of way whenever you come to a right of way situation, and that is simply an allowing another roadway user the privilege of immediate use of the roadway. Right? That's sharing the right of way, giving it to someone else. You wave your hand, you flash your lights. Awesome stuff, very polite. All right? Because imagine you come up to a red light, right? And there's a gas station here on the corner, and that purple car, that guy's looking kind of antsy. Now, from the perspective of the purple car, I have been stuck in this exact position for 45 minutes straight. Traffic would not stop, and then when traffic finally stopped, the line was so long I couldn't just kind of jump in. I would have had to risk my life and well-being to force my way into traffic, and that wasn't going to happen. Right. 45 minutes, I was stuck in that purple car's position. So sometimes you can be cool, but this is how it's supposed to work, right? You're the yellow car. When the light turns green, the purple car has to wait for the road to be clear before entering the roadway. All right, so the blue car goes, the red car goes, the yellow car goes. No other traffic is coming, the purple gets to go out. In my situation, there was lots of more traffic coming and just zero brakes for me to jump out. All right. Now, I know that I don't have a legal right to get out ahead of you to force my way into the roadway, so I waited. All right. Other people in the valley, maybe not so courteous. Some of them are like, hey, my vehicle's bigger than yours, and they just start moving it into the way like, go ahead and hit me. Uh, that would be their fault if you did, but it would also be your fault because you saw them doing it. Uh, it's only if like they did it at the same time, then maybe you could argue. But anyway, I digress. All right. What we need to do or what we may do in this situation is this. Red car go, or blue car goes, red car goes, and then we're like, go ahead, buddy. We let the purple car go and continue on. All right. The day that I was stuck for 45 minutes, had someone done this to me, they would have been my angel that day. They would have been my hero. I would have been like, thank you, Lord, for sending this wonderful person to me. Because I got to work and my taco was cold, my coffee was cold, and my boss was upset. I don't know why I came out with a Boston accent. My boss was upset. He was not happy I was late to work. And I was like, I was stuck in the stripes, man. I stopped for a taco, a coffee. I haven't even drank or had any of it. And I just got to work. Why didn't you eat it in the parking lot? Because I didn't want to be eating taco, have an opening come up, and then miss an opportunity to get on the road. Okay, fair enough. All right, see, you're always on time. Go to work. I was fortunate that day, but that was 45 minutes that I was just not a happy camper. So sometimes people force their way, all right? Sometimes you can just be a hero and let them go, all right? Because why do you want to do this? Because when they're going to force their way, they could cause an accident. And when they've been stuck there and they already have that frustrated look on their face, you could be saving them, you know, their job even, because some bosses just don't care. Speed limit. Here's another thing that people in the valley don't seem to understand. But it's okay because as more and more teens take driver's education, as more and more young people take and complete driver's education, more and more drivers know what it means. And things are getting better. They really are. The valley has become a much safer place to drive in the last decade. And I'm very happy to be a part of that now. All right, so speed limit. Let's learn the secrets, right? I've explained what stops do, I've explained yields, you're probably like, 
one of the people in your one of the few people in your family that, that, that knows it. It's an awesome sauce if lots do. All right, but check it out. Basic speed law states that you may not drive safer, or I'm sorry, you may not drive faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions, regardless of the posted speed limit. Right? You may not drive faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions, for the way stuff is right now on the roadway, regardless of the posted speed limit. So if the 55, or if the speed limit says it's 55, but everyone else is driving 35, then we have to drive 35. All right, but let's example it, right? All right, so what does that mean? Let's say you're, you're on a street that's 55. Everyone else is driving 45, and you're being speed racer doing those lane changes, right? You're just hopping left and right and left and right and left and right and going, why are all these people driving so slow? I need to get to work. And then you hear it, You get pulled over, and what does the officer say? They say that you were driving faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions. And what does the ticket say? The ticket says you were driving faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions. All right, and when you look up the vehicle code that you broke, it will say driving faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions. So conditions matters, folks. All right. That's why when it's raining and everyone slows down, everyone needs to slow down. It's the law. Okay. So even if you're driving five miles an hour under the speed limit, you can still get a ticket for going five miles an hour over the speed limit if the weather, your vehicle, whatever, did not permit you to be driving at that speed. Even if it's traffic. Everything has to be perfect if we want to drive the full speed limit. The road, the car, the traffic, the weather, how you're feeling. Hey, you gotta be feeling good. You can't be all like sick or get it ready to pass out from exhaustion or hunger or something. You have to be focused on the roadway because you're part of the process, right? You're the important part. You're the brains behind the wheel, right? If everything is perfect, then you may travel at the speed limits. But for everything that's not, you have to slow down. Right? On my way to work today, I was driving at about 65 most of the way. Uh, or at least on the expressway, I was going 65 most of the way. Why? Because the speed limit was 70, and there was a little bit of water on the road. Not a ton, but just enough to where I was like, nah, you know what? I'm not going to risk it. Right? Well, that's it. It's just a few miles. When it's raining heavy, everybody slows down to 35, 40 miles an hour. Because that's what's safe. Right? When a road has lots of mud on it, well, you need to slow down a little more because... Stopping, turning can cause slipping and sliding. Okay. You always drive the speed that the weather, the car, and your condition, and everything else lets you. Okay. And we can go the speed limit when everything's awesome. Right? Beautiful, sunny, 75, no clouds, traffic's nice and light. Go the speed limit. Not a problem. But if you've heard that lie about, oh, you get an extra five, oh, you get an extra ten, mentiras, all that lies. You do not get to go any faster than the speed limit. Now, for them to give you a citation, it's gonna be one of two. It's going faster than is safe and prudent for existing conditions, or it's going to be 10% over the speed limit. Okay, so that does mean if you're going 50 or 60 in a 55, you won't get a speeding ticket because 10% faster would have to be 61. Okay, it'd be five and a half miles faster. You'd have to be going at least 61 so that they could prove you were doing that. But what if your car is wrong? What if your speedometer says you're doing 60, but you're actually doing 62? So don't test law enforcement when it comes to that. Okay, and then the other one is it's faster than it's safe and prudent. So if the weather conditions aren't great, don't try to drive the speed limit, all right? If you're clearly feeling super sick, don't try to drive the speed limit on fast roads. Take slower roads and drive a little bit slower because you're part of the condition. And if you're not feeling awesome, it's hard to drive awesome. Okay. Next one. Just because it says 55 doesn't mean you have to go 55. At night, I straight up drive five miles an hour slower than the speed limit on my way home the whole way. Two reasons. One, well, I'm going to stop in a shorter distance so if someone does something silly, it'll be easier for me to stay safe. And two, I'm not in a hurry. I'm going home. I love my family, but I'm going to drive safe and get there safe and sound, not rush to them and possibly get hurt on the way. So I just slow down, just 
I have no desire to go any faster than that, so I go like five miles an hour under the speed limit most of the way home, and I get there safe and sound. Because I want to. Because I can. Because there's no law that says I have to go the speed limit. And so I don't get mad at other people when they choose to do the same, because that's their choice. Just like you get to choose to go the speed limit if you want. All right? Now, the speed limit, we also have minimum speed limits. Minimum speed limits generally are in agricultural areas, but if your vehicle cannot do the minimum speed limit, it's not allowed in minimum speed limit zones, right? So that means there will be no tractors, there will be no horse and wagons, there will be no trailers with like 500 foot long of nothing but hay bales traveling at 30 miles an hour because if it goes faster than that, everything's going to blow off. Now, none of that's going to happen on those roads. You're just going to have regular traffic. Right? And then we also have advisory or cautionary speed limits. These are listed under those yellow diamond signs and they tell us how fast we may execute a turn or a curve. And sometimes we even have them by exits letting us know how slow the traffic's gonna be moving down there during peak hours and what the speed limit's gonna slow down to very shortly. Because that's why it's the speed during peak hours. Because if the speed limit down the road is 30, and there's a half a mile of cars, well, they're all gonna be doing that same 30, okay? So just pay attention to those signs, all right? They tell you how you can safely execute those curves and turns under ideal conditions. For everything that's not ideal, slow it down, folks. All right, if it says you can take the curve at 30 and it's raining and your tires probably need to be replaced, maybe we slow it down to like 20 and do it that way, all right? Because for everything that is not Perfect, we need to slow down that speed, folks. All right. Come on. Let me up. I know. Sorry. Sometimes you just don't want to go. There we go. All right. So, regulatory warning signs. All right. And this is a great page because it's got a ton of different signs. And I'm going to give you all some explanations about how some of the questions you're going to be seeing on the test are going to be. Because when it comes to the signs, there's really two kinds of sign, or two types of question for the sign. There's general recognition, and there's causality. Causality is like cause and effect, right? Um, and general recognition means you know what the sign is telling you. Okay, so that's one-way sign. Both of those signs, one's a vertical rectangle, one's a horizontal rectangle. They're both black and white, therefore they're a rule of the road. They're both telling us the same thing. The traffic goes one way at that road to the left. So if you want to turn onto that roadway, you have to turn to the left, okay? Regardless of how it's displayed, both of those signs mean the exact same thing. However, on the exam, the questions you could see with a one-way sign could be something like, you know, um, you see the sign and then you may turn or you must turn left at the next intersection. Well, no, because you don't have to turn onto a one-way street, but you may. You must continue forward or turn left onto the following street. That would be absolutely correct. You may slow down and cautiously turn right. No, because it's a one-way street. We can't turn right there. That's a no-no. All, all judges have buzzed you no. All right. Find the most correct answer and choose that one when you get to the DPS exam. All right. When it comes to the signs, we need the most correct answer. Now, the, the sign below those two, the one with the diamond that says HOV 2 plus only, and if you can read that, that it says uh, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday, you've got a laptop, not a cell phone. All right. Um, but that sign is, the diamond is indicating that it is a special lane. All right. And that special lane happens to be the HOV lane, the high occupancy vehicle, commonly known as the carpool lane. If you see that sign over a lane and it says 2 plus only, if it doesn't have a time, that means at all times, that's only for two or more people in the car. Yeah, that's all that sign's telling you. You can't use this lane unless there's two or more people in the car. Okay. Now, when it's got the, the time restrictions, that means during those hours, 6 through 9 a.m., Monday through Friday, only vehicles with multiple individuals can be in this lane. And that's awesome because just now that you know what it means, means if you run into a situation where you have a carpool lane available to you, I got to use one with my little brother on our way to convention in Dallas, and it probably saved us a half an hour, 45 minutes, and got us a bunch of nasty glares from other people as we were driving past them. The funny thing is, is all the passengers that were glaring at us could have been in the same lane because there were two or more people in the lane. But just knowing what the lane was, 
allowed us to use it. All right, and then next, we've got our do not pass and no passing zone. The old do not pass used to be about this big. Now it's about this long. All right. Why? Because people didn't listen. The white sign was not enough. They made it bigger. They made it bolder. They made it yellow to let people know, hey, don't be silly. This is not a place that it's safe to pass. If they're telling you do not pass, it's not because they don't want you to. It's not because they're trying to hurt your feelings and prevent you from doing it. It's because there is a general hazard, a general factor that causes increased risk of collision in that area. So a do not pass or a no passing zone, it's not because they don't want you to. It's because they're trying to keep you from crashing and dying. So maybe regard those signs with the utmost of attention, unlike the people that made them change the sign, because people had to die for that sign to change. And then they change the sign, because they didn't want that to happen. And hopefully it all stops. If it doesn't, they'll change the sign again in the future. Now that next sign, the one with the, the three arrows technically, but one of them like branches off, that's why it's two, and the other one's the one. All right, so on that one, you may see, you may turn left from either lane, that's very correct. You may turn left from the left lane. Well, that's, that's correct, but it's less correct. You may go straight in the right lane. Well, in that situation, the first one, you may turn left from either lane, is telling you about two lanes of traffic, something that you can do from them. Therefore, it would be the most correct. The other one is telling you you can go left from the left. Well, that's only telling you about one lane. And the other one is you can go right or continue forward in the right lane, and that's only telling you about one lane. So the most correct answer, folks. All right, and then there's our red in action. All right, the circle and bar does not mean Ghostbusters, it means prohibited. That's why they had a little ghost in there, is because the ghosts were prohibited. They were the Ghostbusters, all right? Now, so this is a U-turn buster sign, right? No U-turns in that area, no U-turns at all in that area, all right? Wrong way, if you see this sign, and you turn into a roadway and suddenly you see it, immediately pull over to the right side of the road, wait for traffic to clear up and get turned around, all right? Because if you try to beat another car to the next intersection so you could turn and be going the proper direction, a vehicle doing what it's legally allowed to do and doing everything right could swing around that corner and hit you as you're approaching because you're driving the wrong way. So please, anytime you wind up in a wrong way situation, stop pull over to the right, wait until everything is safe and clear and you have all the time in the world to get turned around and get yourself turned around, all right? If you do it when you're in a hurry, please still continue to be patient because any time we choose to do something now because I'm in a hurry, we're choosing to set safety and caution aside and putting ourselves in danger. Don't do that, folks. All right, now there's our exit advisory speed limit or exit cautionary speed limit and that's telling you that during high traffic hours where the traffic is backed up like a half a mile that's the speed everyone's going to be going and it's also telling you that down the road that's the speed limit over there because that's why everyone's going that speed awesome right all right then speed limit 55 that is the maximum speed that you may drive but only under ideal conditions everything must be perfect perfect and then then you can drive 55 the stop sign, boom, the octagon, we already know what it means. It means stop, which is funny because the other octagon means go. Um, and then there's our advisory speed limit sign underneath a curve, right? Turns, right angles. Curves are like nice and swoopy like that one is, all right? And that one's telling you that under ideal conditions, you can take that curve at 35 miles an hour. But for everything that's less than ideal, we slow it down, folks. All right. And now rapid fire, let's learn a bunch of signs. All right, whoops, no, too far. We've gone too far, ha ha. All right, so number one. Number one is indicating to you, hey, watch out. Now these are all warning signs, first and foremost. And number one is watching you, hey, watch out. There's an intersection coming up ahead and people have crashed it. That's why that sign is there because people have missed the intersection and had collisions. Therefore, they put that sign up to let you know it's there, okay? Number two is letting you know that the low point or the lowest point of the bridge you're about to go under is 12 foot 6 inches tall. So if your load is higher than 12 foot 6 inches, it's about to get scraped off. Do not go in there. Okay. Most of the time, it's not going to bother us, it's not going to affect us. 
But if you see another vehicle that has a very high load and you realize the sign is saying, yeah, th th there's no way that this vehicle is going to make it under here, you either want to be ahead of them or far enough behind that you're not in the debris field. Right? Debris is like all the junk and stuff that's going to get broken off because they're going to crash into that bottom of that bridge. Right? Number three is indicating that a median is opening up on the road next to us. And because we read the signs bottom to top, that means that our neighbors on the other lane are going to be coming towards us because their median is ending, but ours has just begun. So we're going to be moving to the right and watching for traffic coming in from our left. All right. Number three and number 15 are the exact same sign, just flipped over. Because we read them bottom to top, this is the sign that the other lane sees when we see number three. And when we see number 15, the other lane is looking at number three. All right? Because for us now, the median is ending. We're going to be moving to our left. Be careful with traffic as they're going to be going around their median as well. Number four is when one lane is coming up and it's going to run right next to yours. It's the safest kind of lanes coming together because nobody's lane vanishes. Both lanes still exist. Number five is a double curve. No sharp angles. See, number 13, that's got a right angle. All right, number five, no right angles. Therefore, it is curves. Number 13 is a turn. Number 10 is a curve. Okay. Number five is a double curve. There is a double turn, but it's got two right angles in it. All right. It looks kind of like, you know, Harry Potter's little lightning bolt scar. Anyway, uh, I guess that reference getting kind of old. Um, I can't think of any anime characters with a lightning scar because they would just call them Harry Potter. So moving on. Uh, <laughs> number six is a T intersection. Except you are on the lane that continues on, a lane to your right side, because we read the signs bottom to top, a lane to your right side is going to be the one that's arriving at the T intersection. They'll also be looking at, when they get to the T intersection, they'll be looking at an arrow pointing in both directions. That's letting them know that they've arrived at that dangerous intersection. They need to be careful turning left or right, and they need to turn left or right because their lane has ended. All right, number seven, rough road, means that the road itself is not uh, a nice, pretty paved road. Could be gravel, could be dirt, could be caliche, whatever it is, it's not a nice paved road. That's what rough road is indicating. Number eight is a um, transit crossing. Well, don't know why I lost that one. Number eight is a transit crossing. It is a little used road cutting through, and in this situation, it's cutting through a double curve. But a transit crossing can happen to a straight road too. So that would just be a straight line with that diagonal line going through it. It's just a little used road that cuts through the roadway that we're on. And that little angle of the line will always show you what angle the, the traffic is actually going to be moving in. Uh, number nine is indicating to us that the road that we're on is currently a one way. But after we cross the next block, it's going to become a two way. So we need to prepare ourselves and move to the left. Okay, so that's the causality, right? What do you do when you see number nine? Well, we need to be prepared to, to, or not to the left. We need to be prepared to move to our right and stay on the right side of the road. That's the causality before, or behind it. What is the sign telling you? It's telling you that you're approaching a two-way street. That's why the traffic is, or the arrows are going in both directions, because the traffic's going in both directions after the sign, right? Number 10, as I've already said, is a curve. Since we read our signs bottom to top, we know that that curve is going to the right, right? Number 11 is, looks like a little plus sign or a cross, and that is a sign indicating a traffic crossing. Number one, there's a light there. Number 11, there's probably not a light. It'll be like an intersection with some stop signs or some yield signs, all right? But the same thing, it's an intersection where people have crashed because they didn't notice it. Be careful. The sign is there to save your life. For reals, because somebody else's was lost because they didn't have it. Now, number 12 is indicating to y'all that a lane is ending, all right? Because we read our signs bottom to top, for one million bonus points that don't mean anything, who can tell me what lane is closing? Is it the right lane that's closing, or is it the left lane that's closing, based on sign number 12? Anybody, ladies and gentlemen, anyone courageous enough to show me that they can read a sign? Bottom to top. Which lane is closing? The right lane or the left lane for number 12? Yeah. You got it. Perfect. 
the right lane is closing. That's why the right side of the sign has that little indention, right? Now, when we see this sign, if we are driving in the, and thank you very much, you get 1 million absolutely useless points, but you can brag about them for the rest of your life because Steve once gave me a million points. Uh, hopefully that means something in the future. Uh, <laughs> all right, but yeah, it's, you just, you look at the sign, you see that lane is ending. So what do you do? All right, I'm in the right lane. Oh, look, right lane ending. Let me move over right now. Because when I don't, if I stay in there until the very end, I'm going to wind up causing a traffic jam. Because I'm going to have to stop, and then I'm going to jump into the lane, and then all that traffic's going to have to stop because I wasn't going any speed. So they're going to have to go to no speed. And then other people are going to be like, oh, look, this lane is empty. I'm going to go in this lane. And then they stop, and it just it breaks down, and now there's a traffic jam. Because people don't know how to get out of a lane that's closing. right? If you ever see that on the expressway, that's why it happens. Don't think that that empty lane is making things faster for you. It's actually adding to the problem and causing a traffic jam. All right, so number 13, that is a right turn. It's got a right angle, therefore it is a turn. We need to slow down for turns way more than we do curves because turns are sharper, right? Okay, number 14, there's that winding road again, all right? All over North Texas, we've got winding roads. Anywhere where the road is cutting in between hills, because it's cheaper to make a road in the low point on the ground than to bulldoze a hill and make a straight road. So they make lots of winding roads in Texas because Texas has a lot of hill country. We need to be careful there for three real reasons. One, those roads get very slippery and quite often you're crashing into trees when you do slip off the road if you're driving too fast. Number two, other drivers tend to drive too fast on windy roads because they're enjoying themselves. It is a nice little fun road to drive on. But people get out of hand, they start going too fast, they encroach into your lane, come around the corner, and crash. And then the third problem, the winding roads, the, the reason we need to watch out for them is animals. Because anywhere there's lots of bends in the road, there's lots of opportunities for there to be a deer just around the corner. For there to be a flock of turkeys. It straight up happened to me, I hit the brakes, killed three of them anyway. Um, right? It happens. Right? So, winding road, now you know. Number 15, as I've already mentioned, the median is ending. Prepare to move to your left. Watch out for traffic. All right. And then number 16 is a personal pet peeve of mine, um, just as much as number 12. But number 16, is it only bothers me when people get it wrong on their exam. Right. Look at that slide, and I want you, or look at that sign, and I want you to think of a water slide. Because that's what those curved lines look like, right? A water slide. Because number 16 is indicating to you that that road is only slippery when it is wet. Okay. Only under wet conditions does that road become slippery. Now, on the DBS exam, it's going to be like, this road is slippery at all times. This road is slippery under dry conditions. This road is slippery under wet conditions. Yes, when it's wet. Why? Because traffic jams happen there, and people drip oil, and oil builds up. And now, in that area, when the road gets very wet, all that extra oil in the roadway prevents the water from sinking in. So it beads on the top, and now the road is slippery when wet. Number 16, slippery when wet. I think I've said it enough, but one more time, car water slides, slippery when wet for number 16. Okay. Uh, well, number one, you are on a steep downgrade. Watch out. Right? What does that mean? That means you're going downhill and it's kind of steep. Um, be careful because your brakes may overheat on that downhill. Right? If you feel your brakes slip, you need to pull over, stop the car, and let them cool down for a little while because that's called... Uh, break fade, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, number one is letting you know that. So number one, the reason there's a picture of a truck on there though is it takes us as cars and trucks and SUVs to stop or longer distance to stop on those steep downhills. Those big old 18 wheelers become death machines. So if you have to hit the brakes in front of one of them after you've seen that sign, you're in trouble. You better pull off to the side of the road and hope you can stop there. All right, number two, we need to know this one once again. The importance is because of the existence of 18 wheelers. Ramp metered when flashing means any 18-wheeler on the roadway that's passing through there is going to need to move over and take that exit. So if you have an 18-wheeler to your left, slow down, allow them to get ahead of you so they can move over. Or if they're going under the speed limit, which they never are, speed up, get ahead of them so they can move over. But it's much easier to drop back than it is to outrace. And they have to move over when they see that. If they don't, and the cops spot them skipping the... The way station, because that's what it is, a way station, uh, they can get pulled over and fined. Uh, and the company can get fined thousands of dollars. So they will try to move over. Don't stay next to a truck when they need to. 
Number three, there's that bump, a high point in the roadway, right? Ignore it at your own peril. Just slow down, go over the bump safely, and then speed back up. That's the safe thing to do. Number four is the you better turn or else sign. Number four is letting you know that there is a sharp turn. Please do not go through here. It is very easy to lose control and crash. Slow down, make the turn. That's what number four is for. So when you see that, make sure you slow down. Don't try to take that as fast as humanly possible. Number five is a temporary division of the lanes. Don't worry, they will be coming back together shortly. They're just going around an obstruction, maybe even something of cultural interest. Number six is the please don't hit me sign. They put this around objects that are near the roadway that uh, could get hit. They'll put them in front of things that pose extreme hazard if you accidentally go off the road and hit them like giant boulders on the side of the road. Um, if they've got like a fountain around town plaza, they'll have those there. But it's just indicating things that are dangerous and you need to avoid hitting. Number seven, letting you know that trucks are in use on that road. You will see trucks on the road. If you don't want to share a road with trucks, stay off that road. All right, trucks. That's all number seven means is trucks. And there's a picture of a truck on there. Awesome, makes it easy. All right, number eight, road narrows. What does that mean? That means that the road that we're driving on is going to get less wide because that's what narrows means, less wide. Okay, so that's easy. The road gets less wide. Sometimes the shoulders are dropping off. Sometimes the lane themselves are getting narrow. All right, when the lane gets narrow, things get dicey. It gets a little more tough to keep a good lane position. When the shoulders drop away, but the lanes stay the normal size, generally it's not an issue, but we have to be paying attention to what's happening. All right, number nine is the dip sign. That is a low point in the roadway. Ignore a high point, ignore a low point, and suffer the consequences. Hitting one of those two going faster than, say, 20 miles an hour can actually cause damage to your vehicle. Um, and like I said, for me, it was over a couple hundred bucks each time. Uh, number 10, soft shoulder, means the side of the road, that's the shoulder of the road, the side of the road, is soft. Do not stop there, you will get stuck. Once again, I, through a lifetime of not listening to signs, have learned this. I saw soft shoulder down here in the valley. I pulled off to the side of the road to change out of flat. My jack got buried in the mud, and the, the, the guy laughed at me in two different languages about getting my jack, like, buried. Um... Happened to me on a mountain, and I was like, what's going to be soft out here? Apparently, the sand that they use to de-ice mountain roads um, collects in little pockets, and that's what the soft shoulder was. I found a beach on a mountain. I got stuck, and that guy thought it was hilarious. Number 11 used to be a sign that said bridge. That's it. It was one word, and it said bridge. But if you've ever seen the classic movie Beetlejuice, People do not slow down when they approach a bridge. I do not know why. People tend to drive more recklessly when they're in dangerous situations, and it baffles me, but it's true. And the thing is, is that that sign that said bridge, like the, the, the yield sign that needed a change in color or the no passing that they needed the change in shape, that bridge sign just didn't cut it. So what did they do? They went, I know, wait, 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 wait. Check this out, guys. I've got a plan. What if? What if we made the road more dangerous? Wait, what? Yes, over water, we make the road more narrow so they have to slow down and drive cautiously or they could risk falling off into the water. Well, that's crazy. Why would they slow down? Because if they don't, the road is more narrow and they will go into the water. But isn't that crazy? No, because they're not slowing down and they are going into the water. So same thing. Let's try it. What the heck? And straight up, a conversation, something like that had to have happened because number 11 is the road narrows over a bridge. Slow down and proceed with caution, right? And guess what? Since they did this, since they made roads more dangerous, instead of just putting a sign letting people know there was a bridge, there have been less accidents involving bridges and people falling into water. I know, we're terrible. But, hey, that's what it is. So, number 11, the road's not getting skinny. It's not on slim fast. It's that it's going over water and the road narrows. All right. Number 12, highway intersection ahead is like the light on the sign, is like the little cross symbol on the sign. It's letting you know two paths are crossing up ahead and it's dangerous. That's why the sign exists. That's why the sign is there. Number 13, we have arrived at the T-intersection. Now we need to proceed with caution because when we turn left, 
we're going to be turning left in front of vehicles going at speed. When we turn right, we're going to be turning right in front of vehicles going at speed. And when we turn left, we're going to be crossing that right lane as well. So we need to be extra careful in those very dangerous intersections. Number 14 is a Y intersection. The Y intersection is not like number five. It is straight up. This road is going to new places. All right, you signal to identify or indicate to the other drivers which direction you're going, but you're not required to by law because it's the road that's splitting, not you that's choosing to change direction. Um, but you signal anyway to let the other drivers know what's going on, and you continue on in the direction that you need to. All right, but the Y intersection, that is just, it's taken off. It may come together later, but no guarantees, folks. Number 15, that's the Spice Girl song. That's the lane when two become one. And this is a dangerous situation because the vehicles on this lane are all driving, right? And then this lane comes up and curves and joins. And so now all these vehicles have to merge. Now in this situation, the vehicles coming in on the merging lane need to be looking, positioning themselves to fit into gaps that exist in traffic that's on the driving lane and make sure they maintain the same speed as them so that they just kind of like come together and get behind them because if they don't crash, only one lane. We need to make sure we're doing everything we have to to stay safe in number 15 situation. All right, now sometimes that's how the on-ramp for the expressway is. If you cannot get up to speed before arriving at that point, do not try to get to that on-ramp. If it's just like a right turn and then boom, you're there, no. You do not have the room to get up to speed. Go down the road, make sure you get up to speed because these speed matters. If you're driving slower than the traffic coming from behind you, if you're driving faster than traffic ahead of you, but it's much easier to be going too slow. It really is. So do not try to get on the expressway if that's the kind of on-ramp they have and you cannot get up to speed. And then number 16, that is the watch for meat bag sign. Watch for pedestrians. Because that's, that's, unfortunately, when a car hits a human person, that's what a human gets reduced to, a bag of meat. Um, because cars, cars weigh thousands of pounds and generate tons of force. And when you hit a fragile human with a car, well, it becomes a bag full of meat and bone chips. All right? So please, folks, always remember, pedestrians always have the right of way. Even if they're being crazy walking out into the street, you still have to try to stop to not hit them. Right? That's the rules, that's the law. All right? And moving on. Now, we have our construction signs. All right, construction signs are awesome uh, if you speak and read English. If you don't speak and read English, uh, these can be a little tough, so in the valley they can be problematic for some people. All right? um, but for those of us that do speak and read the language, you know, these things are easy because they're telling you exactly what they mean. Shoulder work. They're working on the shoulder, the side of the road. Boom. One lane road, 1,000 feet. That means regardless of how many lanes the road has, in 1,000 feet, it's all going to merge down to one. Be sure to get in the right lane. You'll have a sign indicating which lane it is. Right? The little dude holding on the box, the cereal? No, it's, it's actually a flag waiver, and it is letting you know to watch for a construction project down the road, 500 feet. Right? There may be people or machinery there. Right? Road closed 1,000 feet means in 1,000 feet you're going to have to turn left or right because the road is closed. Okay? Detour 1,000 feet. Well, in 1,000 feet, you're going to have to detour. A detour is an alternate route around construction. End construction means that you have finally exited the construction zone. But there is no end in sight in the valley. <laughs> right? Narrow lanes ahead, well, we already learned narrow means not wide or less wide. So less wide lanes ahead. Okay, I understand that. Be careful. Stay in my lane. Road work, one mile. That means for the next one mile, we are in a construction zone. All traffic fines are doubled if there are machinery or people present. Okay. Slow traffic ahead. No, it's not telling you they're stupid, although some days, man, it feels like that. But no, slow traffic ahead is warning you that... There's probably a lane closing down and people are messing up and trying to stay in that lane until the very last second, so now the traffic is slowing down. They anticipate traffic slowing down due to congestion, okay? So we drive carefully, right? Road construction ahead means they're working on the road ahead. Be careful, slow down, 
proceed with caution. Traffic fines are doubled if workers or vehicles or, or machinery is present. Fresh oil is kind of like a slippery when wet sign, but it's temporary because the fresh oil dries up and then the appropriate amount of oil soaks into the rocks and everything's fine. So once it's collected a little bit of dirt after like a week or two, everything's good to go. But before that, it's fresh oil and that will get slippery if it gets wet. And then those detour signs, first you see the detour sign advising you, hey, there's gonna be a detour coming up very shortly. And then you'll see that second sign, the arrow telling you what direction you have to turn, what direction you have to go for the detour. And once again, a detour is an alternate route around construction. All right, I'm gonna leave it, folks. Railroad signs. First comes the circle. You see that at least, you know, like 100 feet, 100 yards before you arrive at the railroad tracks. And then comes the cross buck right at the railroad tracks. This, the cross buck, that X looking thing is also the one that has those arms and the gling, 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 and the flashing red lights. Folks, never, ever, 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 ever try to beat the train. All right, those arms drop at a set speed based on the average speed of a locomotive on those tracks. So if that train is coming at faster than average speed, you'll most likely get hit as you try to race those arms coming down. Never try to beat the train because the train wins in all ties and losses. If you lose, the train totally wins, you're gone. If you tie, the train totally wins, you're gone. If you beat the train across and law enforcement saw you do it, well, you could get several citations, uh, reckless endangerment because you endangered your life, the life of all of the passengers in your vehicle. Hopefully there's no kids in your cars when you do that because they may call CPS on you, if not take them away on the spot and arrest you. Uh, but they can also charge you for you know, reckless endangerment because you put the lives of the people in train in danger because your car could have blown up when the train hit it and derailed it and people could have died. So never, ever, 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 ever try to beat the train. If the train catches you, you have just lost a half an hour or 20 minutes. I am so sorry. But, oh, well, because what's worth more, 30 minutes of your life or the rest of it? Because if you try to beat the train, you may, may very well spend the rest of it failing. So don't do it, folks. All right. Um, and then that crossbook, as I said, is immediately before the railroad tracks. All right, now guide signs provide a variety of information. We'll see them above the roadway. Uh, they mark routes, intersections, service areas, and other points of interest, right? International signs all symbol or utilize symbols instead of words. So like the airplane sign, if you're in Beijing, oh, okay, places that I can confirm. If you're in Humara, Australia, when you approach the airport, there is an airplane sign. When you are in Mexico City, Mexico, there is an airport sign as you approach the airport. When you are in Rome, well, uh, not Rome, uh, what was it? Uh, Fer well, F if I can remember the name of the city in Italy. But if you are in Italy on your way to an airport, there's an airport sign. In Japan, if you are on your way to the airport, there is an airport or an airplane sign. Because international signs use those images that are internationally accepted. A bicycle is a bicycle is a bicycle. A truck is a truck is a truck. A plane is a plane is a plane. A bear is a bear is a bear. Right? A deer is a deer is a deer. If you see a deer crossing in Europe, it's just a slightly bigger deer than the one we have here in the United States. All right? But still a deer. All right? International signs all utilize symbols instead of words so that everyone can understand them. And that's why important things are reduced to symbols when they can. Okay? Traffic signals. Now, you have been lied to your entire life. Somebody went and told you the green means go. And, and, and that's like saying that, um, you know, if an animal isn't vibrantly colored, it's safe to eat. Yeah, that's mostly correct, but you're missing a very critical detail there. Because some animals aren't vibrantly colored and super dangerous to eat. Because um, the thing with green is, green doesn't mean go. It means you may proceed only when the intersection is clear. And that is of passenger, or pedestrians, that's meat bag walking people bicycles, skateboarders, rollerbladers, all of those guys, and other cars. Once there's nothing left in the intersection, then you may go. That is what a green light means. It does not mean just go. Because if there was an 18-wheeler coming and honking its horn and your light went green and the 18-wheeler wasn't slowing down, would you go ahead of that 18-wheeler going, well, he's got to stop. No, because you can carry yourself into a grave that way. 
Okay? Vehicles don't have to stop. Their drivers can choose to make the wrong decision at any point in, in, in the day, right? So do not go, they have to, and that's the reason you do something, okay? Because straight up, anytime you do it, because, well, it's my turn, I have the right of way, well, if they decide to say, I don't care, you're still gonna wind up the other person in the collision. So we always wait until it's safe and clear before going. All right. Now, a yellow light means slow down and proceed with caution. Make every effort to stop safely. All right. But later on um, in these slides, I will show you something that visually lets you know if you're going to make it through an intersection before the light goes red or not. Uh, and then we'll have a little description here in a second as well. And then red lights. Red lights mean exactly what you were taught. Red lights mean exactly what they mean in Squid Game. You better stop. You better come to that full stop. No moving. Moving back. Squid game. Remember. Um, <laughs> yeah, just come to the full stop for the red light. All right. If you need to turn right on a red light, you are allowed to turn right on a red light. But it's first and foremost a red light. We come to a full, complete stop. One, two, three. While you're counting, you're checking that it's safe over there. Safe over there, everything good, nothing over here going to get me, and then you go. Make a full stop and then a right turn on red, not, you know, just make a right turn on red. No, you need the green light to just keep going. Otherwise, it does require the stop. All right, now, yellow light. Um, how do I know if I'm going to make it through a yellow light? When approaching any traffic signal, you should have your foot covering the brake as you approach and cross the intersection, right? Now... Why do we do this? Because lights change quickly, okay? And if you're gonna make it through, you're gonna make it through. If you're not gonna make it through, you slowing down a little bit isn't gonna change that, okay? So, as you approach an intersection, take your foot off the accelerator, cover the brake, and go. And if the light changes to yellow then red before you arrive, you'll, you're already covering the brake, you'll be able to start slowing down and stopping, right? If the light stays green, then once you hit the intersection, foot back to the gas pedal, continue on through. Same as a yield, right? Okay. Now, traffic lights are set by timers. If you are traveling at speeds at or below the speed limit, generally 10% under the speed limit is it. That's the magic number. If the speed limit on that road is 50, 10% under is 45. If you're driving 45 and there's multiple lights and they're on timers, it'll be green light, green light, green light, right when you need them. Okay. If you're going 30, it's 27, because 10% of 30 is three. So 27. 27, that's green light, green light, green light. Okay. If you're going above the speed limit, the light will not be yellow long enough for you to make it through the intersection, nor will it be, uh, you have enough distance to stop before the solid line in the event that the light turns yellow on you. Okay. Now, you ever been in a car and you feel like you're hitting every single red light? Well, that happens. That actually does happen. Why? Because this is you with the, the red light. Come on, 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 come on. All right, green. Okay, red light, red light, red light, And you're waiting at this next red light that you got to in record time. And then here comes all the other traffic and you're looking at the rear view mirror like, come on, 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 come on as the traffic's slowly catching up to you. And as that first car catches up to you and they drove extra slow, 10% under the speed limit, the light changes and they never even stopped. They just smiled. They, they just gave you one of these as they shot by going 27 miles an hour. And you now are stepping on the gas because now they're ahead of you and you're throwing it. And you're hitting the brakes again because another red light. Because that happens. But if you drive sedated, if you go those 10% under the speed limit, that is not going to happen to you. Instead, you will get all green lights. But this only works when lights are under timers. Now, when are they not under timers? During high volume traffic. What's that mean? During the busy, busy road hours, uh, 7 to 10 a.m., uh, 4 to 6 p.m., uh, and then at uh, 1 to 2 p.m., or 1 to 2 a.m., they're also on sensors. Why? Because that's the uh, club and then bar hour, right? But during the times of day where it's super busy, everything's on a sensor to allow as many people to go as possible. 
But the rest of the day, it's all on timers. So drive sedately, drive chill, and you will get there like those five seconds faster that you really wanted. All right, but that's really all you're saving because getting every red light or catching every green isn't saving you a ton of time. It's not. So you're going to get there in about the same amount of time. The variance is about 30 seconds. The only time is, is when you're on a road and you don't have to stop. That's when speed is going to dictate how long it's going to take you to get there. All right? Because it doesn't matter how fast you get to the light. The light is going to stay red for a set amount of time. You just take your time getting there, and you're going to do less wear and tear on your car, less taking off, less consumption of fuel, and you'll feel like you get there faster. You really don't. Because if you stop and go and stop and go, you're, you're, you're only losing about 30 seconds. But that's it, all right? Um, so the three white lines. Sometimes we approach an intersection and we've got not one line, but three lines. Well, where do we stop? We still stop completely behind the thick white line because those other two are for pedestrian crossing. Now, remember I said meat bags always get the right of way. So if there are people waiting at an intersection to cross on a crosswalk, and you arrive at the stop there, you have to let all of them go. Every single last one of them at the crosswalk gets to go because pedestrians always get given the right of way whether they actually have it or not, right? Because it's too easy to die getting hit by a car. All right, folks? So allow all pedestrians to cross, and then once all the pedestrians that are in need of crossing at that crosswalk have crossed, you can then Pull forward, park over those lines to do that setup to prepare for that right-hand turn, waiting for traffic to clear up. We meet our legal obligation, three seconds behind the line, let all the people cross, and then we pull forward. Why don't we do this when people still need to cross? Because now they're either going to need to go behind our car, and if someone rear-ends us while that's happening, boom, pinned person, and they're, 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 they're going to be your fault because you were blocking the crosswalk. And, or they walk out into the street to get around our car, and now they're walking in the traffic lane. They get hit by a car once again, your fault, because you were blocking the crosswalk. Don't block the crosswalk until all the pedestrians have crossed and you're about to make your turn. All right. Now, flashing signals. All right. They alert drivers to dangerous conditions or tell them to stop. All right. Red flashing lights are telling you to stop. You treat it just like a stop sign. You stop. One, two, three. Once you've got that full stop done, once you've done all your checks, make sure there's no traffic coming, then you may go. If there is traffic nearby, if there are people crossing, if there's anything, you wait until everything is safe and clear, and then you go, right? Flashing yellow, we treat that like a yield sign. Take your foot off the gas, cover the brake, and roll through. If someone else needs to use the intersection ahead of you, please slow down, let them do so, possibly even come to a stop if you have to, to let them finish turning. Sometimes they've got like an 18 wheeler in their turning, and you got to come to that complete stop, that's cool, that's legal. That's what the, the yellow light's for, is to let you let them through. So treat it like a yield, slow down, allow other vehicles through the intersection ahead of you, proceed with caution, all right? There is no flashing green, all right? And then roadway markings, they come in two colors, all right? They come in yellow and they come in white. Yellow lines are indicating that the traffic is flowing in the opposite direction when you cross one. Okay, white lines indicate the traffic is going in the same direction. So on your expressways, nothing but white lines. All right, two-way streets, those are the ones with the yellow lines. All right, and then we've got broken lines and solid lines. Broken lines are like open gates telling you that you may cross, you can go through there, you know, pass a car in this area, that's cool. Solid lines are Gandalf versus the Balrog. You shall not pass! only he doesn't come back with the, the sweet white robes afterwards. You just can't be passing or crossing through there. We do not cross solid lines. So when you arrive at an intersection and the line is suddenly solid, we do not cross those lines to get into the proper lane that we wanted to be in. If we made a mistake, we live with it. All right. Now, here we have a broken yellow line. That's telling us that the traffic coming, or in the other lane is coming from the opposite direction. All right. But because it's broken, it is legal to perform a passing maneuver here. All right? So we can pass here. This I like to call a valley pass because there was not enough room. There was not enough space. And that would have been absolutely terrifying for everyone involved. But someone in the valley has done that today. All right? Make sure you have enough room. Make sure you have long, empty, clear road ahead of you. 
before you attempt to pass a vehicle. If you don't have 20, 30 seconds of clear road, you may not have enough space to safely pass them without speeding, and you cannot speed to pass. All right. Now, here the vehicle in the middle lane is approaching a solid line going across the lane. If anyone remembers that sign that showed the, the right lane closing, that's that same sort of little symbol on it. There's the dots for the traffic line, and then boom, the line comes over, and both of them have a lane that ended. Okay, both of them are going down to single lane in this situation. So you needed to have gotten out of the left lane before you arrived at this situation, but someone wasn't paying attention, and now they gotta move over. Hopefully there isn't traffic coming, otherwise they're gonna be causing a little bit of a traffic jam. All right, and then here we have two lanes, one has a solid, one has a broken line. Sometimes it's just so that not everyone's crossing at the same time. Sometimes it's because of the direction that the road is curving. Regardless, if your side is solid, you can't pass while the side with the broken can. But it's okay because if it is just so that not everyone's crossing at the same time, down the road, it's gonna flip. And then you'll get to cross and they can't. This is just to make sure that you don't wind up in this situation. Okay, people, two people coming. Okay, they're both passing a car and they crash as they're trying to get back into their lane realizing there's someone passing on both sides of the road. So yeah, um, take your turn. Wait until you have the broken lane marker. Come on, keep going. All right, but each side will have its opportunity to pass, so stay patient. Now here we have the double solid yellow line. This is the are you kidding me or the no mames line. Because there is zero reason to get on that side of the road. All right, you wanna pass someone? Okay, well we got two lanes on our side. All right, but they don't have a shoulder, we don't have a shoulder. They don't have anywhere to go in case of emergency to swerve out of your way, so there is no reason for you to be getting on that side because all you're doing is inviting a collision, okay? When you see the double solid yellow line, we should not be crossing over it for any reason, folks. Just no, just no, 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 okay? Do not cross the double solid yellow line. If you see a double solid yellow line, stay on your side of the road every time, and if someone else tries to cross it or is about to cross it, look at them and be like, are you kidding me? Or, no, no, you know what I mean. Because, folks, it's dangerous, all right? You cannot cross in that situation. It is illegal, okay? If you need to pass, use the other lane going in the same direction. Now, sometimes a two-lane road with only two lanes will have a solid yellow, like the one that runs in front of my house. Why? Because, once again, there's nowhere for them to go in case of emergency. There are zero shoulder. So if someone's on the wrong side of the road, the only thing that another person can do is either go off-road fury, try to take out some kid at the park right there, or uh, crash. Those are the options. So do not ever cross the double solid yellow line. Okay. Now, right here on this image. Now, you see right here, the traffic signal ahead on the left side is a yellow light. All right, you take a look at that and boom. Right here, we got a yellow light. All right, so if you are approaching this intersection and you have this yellow light, all right, these solid white lines that we have right here are indicating to us the go, no go zone. All right, if you are in this position like the photographer was where these lines start after where you are, you will have plenty of room to come to a complete stop before arriving at this solid white line. If your vehicle is completely inside this though, and you cannot see where the line begins, then you should have enough room to safely make it through the intersection and beyond before the light turns red on you, okay? This is the other method of telling. These lines right here, when they are just those little short ones right before the intersection, they're the go, no go zones. Now, sometimes these lines are super freaking long for other reasons. Those are not indicating go, no, go zones. Those are doing it for a different reason. That's why the length is different. When they look super short, just right as you're getting close to the intersection, that's the go, no, go. And that's literally the point where you are, where you will not be able to come to a complete stop based on the speed limit, because those lines do get longer for the faster speed limits. You will not be able to stop before the solid white line if you try to stop right there, and you will make it through. But if you're in this position where you can see where the line starts and you're outside of the go, no, go zone, then you are in the no, go zone. You are in the, you have to stop. You have all the room you need to stop. If your vehicle is right here at the very beginning, you sometimes have the option to go or not. Um, but depending on weather conditions, like if it's raining, that becomes a no, go zone. 
because or a go zone because you can't stop because of the wet roads. All right, so just remember those lines will also indicate to you uh, where you come on. Yeah, there we go. Uh, where whether or not you will be making it through that yellow light. All right, folks. Uh, bear that in mind. Uh, super handy information to know. It takes all the guesswork out, but we need to be looking for those lines to know. So get in the habit of looking at those lines as you approach an intersection so you know, hey, I'm in that go zone, I have to go regardless, or I'm in a no-go zone, I have to stop regardless. Get into that habit of checking for them. But now, on for the actual lesson for this image. All right, let's say you come to this intersection and you're stopped at the red light waiting to turn right, and then you go, oh no, I needed to go two more blocks and then turn right. Well, what do we do? Okay. Well, you are in a lane that indicates that you have to turn and there is a solid line next to you. We do not cross solid lines. Therefore, you continue to the right. You take that curve, you take that turn, and you continue and you change your route to get to where you wanted to go. Okay. You take the next left and then another left and then you can take another right at the other traffic signal way down there. All right. Now, roadway markings also have reflectors. Okay. Now, the reflectors are on the roadway in the center to help us see where the direction changes. Okay. And uh, I think they're kind of awesome because on a two-way road, they're yellow. On a one-way road, they're white. But my favorite thing because it provides this awesome level of safety is this right here. If you're traveling the wrong way on a one-way street, boom, you don't see little white reflectors, you see little red reflectors. So if you're look, driving down the road and you're like, why are all the little things in the middle red? You're going the wrong way. Pull over to the right, wait for traffic to be clear, turn around. But if you know, you're doing it at night and you don't see any other traffic, you'll be able to get that turnaround real quick. But red reflectors in the road means you're going the wrong way. Stop, pull over to the right, and get turned around. But that's awesome because the first time I went cross country, I was just four. And my mom was driving down the wrong way on a road because we were driving from Kansas back to the valley. It was, well, not really cross country, like a third of the country because Texas is huge. Um, but she was going the wrong way down a road for about a mile and didn't realize it until she saw two cars shoulder to shoulder driving and then she like pulled off the side of the road cussing at him and then realized the line was white and they were both going in the same direction um but it was late she was tired and we almost died because these didn't exist now these little reflectors do exist and boom it just tells you right away hey red reflector wrong way i love it keeps us safe and then we've also got rumble strips rumble strips are these little rib things that they put in the roadway now, these are all super important, like 99% important to 100% important. Um, but 99 is that one over here on the right, and the 100 is the one on the left. And let me explain why. All right, so 99% important, the one on the right. Well, that one is indicating to you, hey, you're going off the roadway, wake up. You'll have these on long stretches of unlit road um, because they want to alert drivers that they are possibly falling asleep, about to leave the roadway. This will wake you up on those long trips. Believe me, I've hit one while driving and starting to nod off. And I was like, okay, I'm up. I need to get out of the car, walk around. Let's go park for a little while. All right? Now, the middle one is a little bit more important than that, but not 100% important because that one is going over the are you kidding me line. We got to remember because, look, right there, that is a single lane road with no shoulder. You can see that up in the picture. The dirt is just right there by the corner. So there is just like that much shoulder. There is no escape route. You got to stay on your side of the road. Now, this is beneficial because, once again, when you're driving at night, this may alert you, hey, you're starting to cross over, but boom, you get back into your lane and you're, you're fine. You know, you're also going to have cars and headlights, and so there's going to be some honking. You'll have other alerts, right? But the one all the way on the left, that one is across your lane. And the reason that exists is because there is something dangerous up ahead. Now, in most situations, it's an intersection that people keep crashing at. Right? But that one right there is actually alerting you to an intersection or something that has costed lives. That's why they went through the trouble of putting it right there. So we need to make sure that we're paying extra close attention because that one is the most dire of warnings. All right? And sometimes you will have places that have like the red blinking light, the stop sign, and these because none of them cut down on the issues. All right? 
And uh, there's actually a, uh, or there was a musical road in Holland. They took it down because the people that live near there absolutely hated it. But they have made musical roads using rumble strips. It's kind of cool that uh, they were able to do that with tech. All right. But that is the end of the slideshow. So every day, make the world a better place, but first do no harm. And that means no harm to yourself or no harm to others. No harm to the world that you live in. Every day, make that decision to make that change in your life that will change how you think, how you behave, what you do, how you treat others. Find a change in your life, even if it's just a small one to start, to help you become more like the person you want to be. All right, you have a hard time making friends? Okay, well, you know, maybe I want to I, I wanna be more, more, more popular. Okay, well, you want to be more popular? That's a long road. Popularity is kind of like you know, going through the right doors. But the first steps on that for an introvert is, you know, pushing those boundaries a little bit. So maybe the change you make isn't, okay, I'm going to say hi to everyone in the world. No, but like, you know, the, 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 the couple people that I run into, you know, in this area or these people that are always there, I'm going to start saying hi to them. See how that goes. Or I'm going to start making eye contact with people instead of trying to keep my head down. Or maybe I'm just going to start walking with my head up instead of walking down staring at my feet the whole time. You know, whatever the change is, no matter how small, well, what is it? The, the journey of a million lifetimes begins with a single step. Uh, I was not the person that I am now 20 years ago. I was very different than who I am now. And five years after that, I was very, very different from just that. It took me a long time to get back to what I perceive as, as a good person. For a while, I was, I, was, I was human trash. I did not like me. I did not like the way that I was behaving, the way I thought, the things that I did, but I made that one change a day. I started by stopping the way I was thinking about people. Stopped thinking about what I could get from people and just started thinking them, of them as other living, breathing people that are just trying to get through their day. So instead of being angry at everybody, I just, that was my first change. You know, it was just, I need to change the way I think about people. And after a while, it became me. And then I made another change and another and another until I was perfectly happy with the person that I had become. Until I could look at myself and be like, yes, this is the sort of person that uh, I want to have as a friend. This is the sort of friend I want to be. This is the sort of friend I want to have. This is the sort of person I want to be. This is the sort of person I want to know. All right? And that's what you do, folks. Every day you just make those little changes. All right? Now, uh, if anyone has any questions, issues, or concerns, we've got a few minutes of time left for that. Uh, tomorrow, we are going to be starting the handbook study and review guide. Uh, that's going to have a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to go through. Um, we're going to do the first half tomorrow. We'll go all the way through to the end of class time, so we won't have time for questions, issues, or concerns. But then, the second day that we do that, which is going to be Thursday... We'll finish up a little bit early. Whatever time we have left, we'll open it up for more questions. If y'all want to know anything, if y'all need to ask anything, and I hope you've got, if you've got questions, start typing them now, because yeah, this is the end of class. This is how I close out, folks. Uh, class is now officially over. If you want to take off, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to hit me up right now. We've got a few minutes of time for such. Um, I will be getting today's homework assignment posted up, the day two assignment, along with uh, textbook chapter two, and then uh, that's gonna be two separate links. Click on each one to open both of those so you can read the chapter and then do the assignment. Um, and then uh, I'll be setting up the video link for tomorrow, the day three live feed and getting that posted up just like a will uh, every single day of class. We'll get the homework and then the next day's feed up until the very end. All right, uh, but I'm not seeing any questions, issues or concerns. So for me and my new t-shirt buddy, Ramen Wolfman, I love it, so adorable. Uh, <laughs> I hope you all have a fantastic day. Uh, hey, fantastic. You too. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, enjoying the class a little bit, hopefully. Um, but we'll see you all tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel for part one of the Handbook Study and Review Guide. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of information tomorrow, learn a whole bunch of awesome stuff. But this is the information that y'all need for the teen drivers written exam all right folks so please do pay close attention and the best day for review is going to be day five because we're going to do that review together the homework assignment together so if you show up for the live stream we'll be doing the homework together as you're watching the video if, if it's saved and that's when you're watching you'll be just getting the answers for the homework assignment uh, by watching the video 
All right, folks. So I'll see y'all then tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel for your live at five afternoon driving lesson here with Steve. Thanks to Hernandez Driving School. See you then, folks. Take it easy and have a wonderful day. I'm sorry. What did guy say? It was don't have a good day. Have a great day.